Anybody who believes that Richard was a fantastic, glorious king has to answer the question of how did he end up in a situation where he relied on so few men. That was Chris Skidmore talking about Richard III and his ultimate defeat at the Battle of Bosworth. In many respects, the uh, European Union of today is like the Holy Roman Empire. It too was designed uh, to a considerable extent to deal with the German question. And that was Brendan Sims talking about Europe. Hello and welcome to the History Extra podcast. My name is Matt Elton and I'm books editor of BBC History magazine, which is the UK's best-selling history magazine. You can find it in all good news agents and on subscription. See www.historyextra.com slash subscribe for subscription deals. We also have digital editions available for the iPad, the Kindle, the Kindle Fire and Google Play. The details of our digital formats, including price, content and availability, head to historyextra.com slash digital. Chris Skidmore is a man who wears two hats. He is both the Conservative Member of Parliament for Kingswood and a successful historian, author of two books on the Tudor period. For his latest book, Chris has been researching the moment when the Tudors first secured the English throne, the 1485 Battle of Bosworth. It was here that Henry Tudor famously defeated and killed Richard III in one of the most well-known battles in English history. But where had the Tudors come from, and what were the conditions that enabled a relatively obscure family to defeat a Yorkist monarch? These are the questions that Chris seeks to answer in an article that he has written for our June issue. Chris was good enough to drop into the studio a couple of weeks ago to talk more about his research, and Rob began by asking him what first drew him to the story of Bosworth. Well, for me, I, I've written two books previously on, on the Tudors, and I was, I was scratching around for a, a third book to write. And it was about 2009, and I, I read in the papers that they made this potential discovery of, of the Battle of Bosworth, you know, with, with cannonballs that had been found, that, that actually it was three miles down the road from the original site where the, uh, the Battlefield Heritage Centre is now. And um, I was a great fan of Juliet Barker's book on Agincourt, and I thought, well, you know, this, this could be a perfect opportunity to, to write about sort of the new, the, the new battle, the revised site, but at the same time to, to set it in the context of how the Tudors came from nowhere to become kings of England. So not just telling us, you know, a military history battle story, um, but actually to almost look at the epic saga, going right back to the 1420s when um, Owen Tudor had a sort of illicit affair with uh, Henry V's widow, Catherine of Awa, and then tell the Wars of the Roses. It's such, a, it's such a complicated story, the Wars of the Roses. You know, you sort of uh, have got various wins on various sides. You've got the, um, the re in 1471. But I thought, if you're able to use the, the Tudors as this sort of golden thread, you're going to be able to, to make far more sense of, of the Wars of the Roses in doing so. So that was my sort of rationale behind uh, the book, and then the structure fell into place uh, pretty quickly after that. So even though the book is, is titled Bosworth, actually it, it's part of the book and partly certainly the feature you wrote for us is also the road to Bosworth. How do we get to this situation where you've got the Tudors up against Richard III? Yeah, and uh, at the time as I was researching, Tom Penn's book, The Winter King, came out. And obviously huge interest then in Henry VII, the sort of father of the Tudor dynasty. You know, what was his personality like? And Tom's book is excellent, focuses on the, the sort of later part of Henry's reign. But I, I was drawn to the fact that this was somebody who was exiled at the age of 14, 1471, gets on a boat with his uncle Jasper, goes, tries to go to France, ends up going to Brittany. And then for 14 years, from the age of 14 to 28, he's almost a prisoner. Well, he calls himself a prisoner um, in his sort of accounts of, to uh, the Burgundian chronicler Communes. And I thought, well, you know, what are the sort of... How was his personality forged by that exile? So actually looking at Henry in exile, the younger Henry... All those experiences that sort of deter, you know, determined how he was then going to come back later on in his life to, to challenge uh, Richard III for the crown. Um, this sort of really drew me to the story. There's not there hadn't been much research actually done on Henry's period of, of exile, so I um, got on a ferry, went to uh, to France, and uh, went down to the archives in Brittany, uh, archives in Nantes, um, and in Vannes. Vannes is one of the places where Henry Tudor. Uh, was kept uh, captive, 
And there's quite a lot of detail there about sort of Henry's uh, actual exile, payments that uh, were given to him, bits of clothing, uh, in details about who guarded him. He was placed in this uh, uh, chateau, um, the Elven, uh, which is in a place called Largoe. It's actually the sort of tallest keep in the whole of France. And he was placed on the sixth floor. And if anyone, if anyone wants to go there, it's remarkable because castles in France, um, they don't have the sort of same sort of heritage we have here, heritage protection. It's in the middle of a forest and, and, and in the middle of nowhere. I remember I, I didn't have a car and I had to basically get a bus and then walk five miles to get to this, to this castle. And I'm a great believer in, in sort of reliving these experiences. Um, and I think that what I've tried to do in the book is to, to, to highlight a, an, an age that uh, hasn't really been covered about, about Henry's youth um, and that those lost years, really. Does a new picture now emerge of Henry from your book? Do you, do you feel we, we understand him differently, potentially, with the evidence you've uncovered? Yeah, I think when you look at the, uh, this child who was a, 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 the product of um, a birth that was extremely traumatic, uh, Margaret Beaufort was only 13 when she, she gave birth. Um, her husband, Edmund Tudor, had only died a couple of months before from, from the plague, um, having been arrested. And uh, um, almost immediately... Uh, Henry's life is, is one of uh, trauma, of one of uh, continuous movement, of uncertainty. Um, at the time, you've got your battles raging, battles of Edgecourt, battles of uh, Tewkesbury. Um, and what you can see from some of the archives, for instance, is Margaret's, um, Margaret Beaufort's counts uh, in Westminster Abbey. There's sort of fascinating little details where she buys her son a bow and arrow. Um, and uh, the various payments she makes for sort of uh, for meals, and uh, Henry goes and visits uh, the the imbecile king Henry the Sixth, who supposedly sort of says, "Well, you know, this is the person who's going to eventually inherit the throne." Um, but with all these sort of archival details, particularly on Henry, I think you can put together a, a portrait of of a man whose uh, whose life is one of uncertainty, but also whose life has been conditioned by an entirely separate um, way of life, uh, you know, live, growing up at the Breton court and the French court, very different from actually uh, sort of a, a, uh, a childhood that might have been experienced in England, for instance. Um, and then I guess with the, with the book and look, focusing at the end on, on Bosworth, obviously everyone focuses on the big characters, Richard III, Henry Tudor, the decisive entrance of the Stanleys at the end of the battle. But the battle itself is far more uh, rich and complex than that. And one of the sources that I used in the National Archives was actually to go through what was it called chancery documents um, for the early part of Henry the uh, Seventh's reign. And it's got a wealth of material about all the people who joined Henry in exile and the rewards they get, um, people who'd fought at the battle and were sore hurt, and, and just trying to actually look at a battle, not so much in terms of the, you know, the, the grand actors on the stage, but all the little men as well, and to look at the consequences of, of what happened to those people who fought. Um, you know, were they injured? Were they rewarded for, for, uh, for fighting? Uh, who died on the battlefield? So there's a wealth of information that I think is yet to be properly looked at. I hope I've, I've done the best job possible. But there's, there's far more that, uh, that can be looked at um, to actually bring to life the 15th century. And Henry Tudor's claim wasn't necessarily the strongest to the throne at Bosworth. Why did so many people come to join his cause and come to fight against the, the King of England, Richard III? Well, the, the interesting thing about Henry Tudor, which you're obviously right, is his claim is, is not a, a strong one. He uh, has his, obviously his father, Edmund Tudor, and his brother Jasper are effectively um, half-brothers to the uh, Lancastrian Henry VI. Um, but given the fact that they were born possibly out of wedlock, a second marriage, they didn't have any claims to the Lancastrian throne. His mother, Margaret Beaufort, has a stronger claim um, through her father, uh, John Beaufort, the Duke of Somerset. Um, but effectively what happens as a result of the Wars of the Roses is all the claimants start disappearing. So after Tewkesbury in 1471, not only is uh, Henry VI uh, bumped off in the tower, but his, uh, his son, who was the great... White Hope of the Lancastrian dynasty, uh, Edward, Prince of Wales, is killed on the battlefield. Um, you've then got the York itself imploding after Edward the Fourth's death in 1483. Clarence is already dead. 
uh, being having drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. And uh, Richard's decision, obviously, to remove the princes, well, Edward the, King Edward V from the throne, means that suddenly Henry becomes the favoured candidate. And it's almost like a sort of modern coalition, really, because what you have is a situation where men who rallied around the Yorkist standard, who were household men of Edward IV, once they realised that Edward V was imprisoned or dead, and Richard had obviously come to the throne, they uh, decided to rebel. They joined Buckingham's Rebellion in the autumn of 1483. When that failed, what's fascinating about Buckingham's Rebellion is actually Henry tries to land up on the shores of Plymouth Sands, and, so, and, he, and in Bodmin, he's actually proclaimed Henry the Seventh. He, he fails to land because obviously um, armed men are patrolling the shores, and he has to turn back. And his, it's a bit of a disaster, really. He has a, a fleet is prepared, and it's scattered by the storms, and he, he returns back, sort of tail between his legs, to Brittany. But he's comforted by the fact that the men that took part in the rebellion, the Yorkists who uh, were supporters of Edward the Fourth, then flee the country and join him, and suddenly. He's got a, roughly a, a, around 400 men come to join his court. And, you know, in the archives in Brittany, we can see sort of details of, of their life. And, uh, and, and uh, it must have been a, a remarkable time to, to have been in that, in that exiled community. Effectively, you've got a, an exiled court having been set up. And it's at that moment when Henry, who was essentially a Lancastrian, um, through the devices of his mother, Margaret Beaufort, who manages to um, communicate with Elizabeth Woodville, uh, Edward IV's queen, um, who's in sanctuary in, in uh, Westminster Abbey. That they arrange for Henry Tudor to marry Elizabeth of York, and it's through the Elizabeth of York's claim, really, that Henry then takes the Yorkist claim to the throne, merges it with his Lancastrian claim to the throne. But, you know, interestingly, the exiles don't, trust Henry at his word. He has to give an oath on Christmas Day in 1483 at Van's Cathedral. And once that oath's given, then it's a resurgence in his, in his claim. But when actually Henry comes to the throne after um, his victory at Bosworth, he calls a parliament and uh, he states his claim not by any patrilineal or matrilineal descent. He states his claim by victory in battle which is sort of fascinating that he does not have the centuries. Obviously, Richard's the first king to, to die on a battlefield for, um, well, the last king to die on a battlefield. But uh, um, Henry uses Bosworth as the moment when he is God's anointed king because it's God's decision that has meant that he becomes king. Where do you think Richard III, if he did, where did he go wrong in, in this run-up to Bosworth? How did he allow himself to let this, this man sort of rampage through his realm and then actually defeat him at battle? Was it through his own personal failings or was it just the opposition to how he'd come to the throne in the first place? It is an um, interesting point with Richard. Obviously, he's a highly controversial king. It's, it's divided along sort of, I, I believe, artificial lines of whether he was a good king, whether he was a bad king, whether he was a tyrant, whether he was a, a merciful king who believed in justice for the poor. But you cannot deny the fact that the kingdom ended up becoming polarised between the north and the south. And after the 1483 rebellion, you've got a lot of the southern counties, a lot of the gentry figures who go and flee to join Henry. As a result, a lot of local offices are, are left vacant. So Henry effectively plants his northern followers in these areas. And all the, the contemporary chronicles, the Crowland Chronicle in particular, you know, picks up around this sort of terror of northern men coming into uh, the southern part of the kingdom. And you can see from sort of archival documents that woods are being felled, that actually there's a mistreatment of property going on. And anybody who you know, believes that Richard was a fantastic, glorious king has to answer the question of how did he end up in a situation where he relied on so few men. Um, there is also the fact that Richard's... Um, financial administration begins to crumble because he needs to buy the support of men. It's, it's, it's amazing to see how much he gives away, how much of his patrimony he gives away, how many annuities he gives away. Um, by the end of his reign, having actually abolished this practice of so-called what are called benevolences, where um, a king can ask subjects for money, loans, but actually they're not really loans, he starts doing it himself all over again. And it just is sort of this spiral of decline as he becomes more unpopular. He's running out of money, so therefore he needs to take more money off his subjects. Leaves him in a situation highly vulnerable. And you know that Richard, 
is in trouble when in December 1484, nearly a year before Henry actually invades, he's issuing proclamations against Henry Tudor. Interestingly, the word Tudor is not is, 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 is usually Henry Earl of Richmond, and, and Richard makes a real play on his Welsh background as if he's a Welsh bastard, and um, that he's trying to ensure that the French will take over the kingdom, and it's, it's really inflammatory language. But but by May 1485, Richard knows he's in desperate trouble, which is why he moves to Nottingham, right in the centre of his kingdom, almost like a spider in the web, because he's expecting Henry Tudor to land, he doesn't know where. So he, he goes to Nottingham effectively thinking, well, that's probably the best place that actually he can um, anticipate any invasion from wherever it comes in the kingdom. But he knows that the, the game is up. So was Bosworth still a close-run thing, or, or because Henry had secured the support of people like the Stanleys, was he going into it as the favourite, really, in the battle? No, not at all. One that, it's absolutely remarkable that Henry manages to pull off this feat, so it's sort of... I'd call it the only successful in, uh, invasion of England since the uh, 1066. Um, you have a situation where Richard is able to assemble uh, an army of 15,000 men through a process called the Commissions yeah. of Array. He's, he, and uh, he still has the support of the Duke of Norfolk, one of the, uh, the most significant nobles in the kingdom, the Earl of Northumberland, Henry Percy. And... All the chronicles talk about this sort of massive army that he, he puts together and his, his ability to uh, create an artillery force. The past couple of years he's been stockpiling weapons and so uh, one of the ballads in the, of, of the battle talks about him having 140 cannon all chained in a, in a row. Um, Henry, in contrast, only has roughly around 5,000 men. He's got his 400 English supporters, but in order to try and actually get a, a reasonable force, he has to um, employ mercenaries from a camp in Normandy um, who are sort of talked about as being the worst kind of men taken from the refuse of, of the people. Um, and obviously with mercenaries, there's no guarantee that they will remain loyal at any one stage. So when Henry lands at Milford Haven, he, he lands at this place called Mill Bay uh, near Dale, right on the sort of um, western tip of Wales, um, He's probably got, at that point, around 3,000 men with him. And then as he makes his way journey through Wales, he picks up uh, Welsh support along the way, and in particular a, a gentleman called Rhys Ap Thomas, who comes along with 1,500 men. Mm. But Rhys only joins once he's been promised the chamberlainship of South Wales. So there's lots of bargaining that's going on. And it's often seen as all the... It's inevitable that Thomas Stanley is going to end up supporting Henry because Thomas Stanley is, ends up being married to Margaret Beaufort, so there's that sort of connection there. But that's not the case at all. Um, Thomas Stanley is a fascinating character. The Battle of Blore Heath back in 1459, he promises his support but doesn't turn up at the battle. He's one of the consummate politician who never gets involved if he can help it, which is why he probably survives the Wars of the Roses. His brother, Sir William Stanley, is a bit more of a hothead. And it seems that William Stanley gives his support in advance to Henry, but Henry ends up meeting the Stanleys the night before the battle at this place called Merivale Abbey. And it's a fascinating place. You can still go visit. It's a Merivale church, and they've got a bit yeah. of stained glass that sort of Henry commissions after the battle a couple of years later when he returns to visit. But Thomas Stanley says, yeah, I promise my troops will be there at the battle. But when it actually comes on the day of the battle, uh, Thomas Stanley sits by the wayside, and Henry has to go into battle with only 5,000 men compared to Richard's 15,000. So, so actually, he was far from the favourite when the battle began. So Richard must have felt quite confident seeing his numbers against Henry's. Yeah. Um, Richard's able to divide his battle into the traditional medieval form and, um, formation of three battles. So he's got a vanguard, a main battle where the king sits, and a rear guard, and the rear guard is um, held by the Earl of Northumberland, the, the vanguard by the Duke of Norfolk. Henry's got so few troops that he's not actually able to arrange his um, battle into this sort of traditional formation. So all he can do is create two wings. So he has his little vanguard that is led by a fascinating character, John de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. Um, and the issue with Oxford is a brilliant military commander, but the last time he's actually fought is at the, the Battle of Barnet in 1471. And a bit rusty, then. A bit rusty. He ends up... Um, making a huge mistake at Barnet when um, it's in a mist and uh, Oxford has a, a livery which is a star with streams and uh, unsurprisingly in the mist it gets confused with the livery of the Yorkist sun and 
his own sides start attacking each other yeah. because he didn't actually yeah. keep his side close enough together and he remembers this lesson. Oxford ends up um, being arrested eventually and, and being sent to uh, the castle, Ham's castle on the Calais Pale. And eventually he manages to escape in 1483 and joins Henry. And he's a devout Lancastrian. But Oxford's probably mulling or, you know, his defeat from 1471. And he, he comes back and leads the vanguard, but he's determined that he won't make the same mistake again. And how Oxford manages to defeat Richard's vanguard is, you know, is fascinating because the sources talk about this sort of famous maneuver where he goes around a marsh and then manages to get the sun and the wind behind him. So that obviously if you've got the sun staring in your eyes and Richard's force, uh, well, you, it's difficult to fight. If you've got the wind behind you, your arrows are going to fly stronger. Um, and he pulls off this manoeuvre, which actually is sort of a classic military manoeuvre, which is in the sort of uh, uh, medieval writer Christine de Pizan, who she writes a book, Book to Fates to Arm, which actually Oxford then gets translated by William Caxton two years later. And uh, they manage to, to pull off this manoeuvre, which then breaks Richard's uh, vanguard. And it's almost in desperation then, once his vanguard's been destroyed, uh, Richard decides to, to make, he, he spots Henry Tudor. What's also happening is Richard's rear guard, led by the Duke of Northumberland, does nothing. Um, and you already you're seeing the, the treachery taking place. You've got all these men who have been, have been summoned, but the rear guard refuses to, to move, and uh, the, one of the chroniclers talks about it, just sort of, they, they stand hoving from afar, and some people start to flee. And I think it's at that moment when Richard realises the loyalty at his... It, it, in his army is breaking down that he, he makes that sort of kamikaze last attempt. He spots Henry Tudor's standard and charges on horseback towards it. And that's when the Stanleys turn on him and... Yeah, I mean, everybody thing. when they talk about Bosworth always says, oh, my horse, my horse, a kingdom for a horse. Every single contemporary account of Bosworth turns that on its on its head. And there's a, there's a, a Burgundian, Juanda Saltzar, who is there and is helping Richard. Um, and he, he, he turns to Richard and says, you know, you, the, your army is falling to pieces, the, the, your, your men are refusing to fight. Here's a horse. Flee now for another day. And Richard effectively turns around and says, no, give me my battle axe. I'm going into battle. In a way, you should turn Shakespeare around and say, you know, a horse, a horse? <laughs> <laughs> my horse, forget it. I don't want the horse. That's why you should really be yeah. relating Shakespeare. Um, and this whole idea of Richard being sort of feeble-bodied is nonsense. He goes into battle. He manages to to unhorse uh, this guy, Sir John Cheney, who's actually six foot eight, is the tallest soldier of his day. Uh, he was Edward the Fourth, master of the horse. And uh, the fact that Richard was able to manage to knock him off his horse is remarkable. And then he manages to uh, get to William Brandon, who is Henry's standard bearer, which shows you how close he came to actually probably getting to Henry himself. So you've got this battle around the standards taking place. Even Richard's standard bearer, uh, Sir Percy Thrivel, is, um, has his, both his legs cut from underneath him. And he's still holding yeah. on to the standard. You know, it's vital in, in medieval battles that the, the standard does not fall. And so this f intense fight is taking place, and it's only then when Sir William Stanley realises that Henry's in trouble as he decides to charge in, and he has 3,000 men. They, they come in and sweep, he sweep Richard into this marsh, and that's when sort of, Richard faces his final moment of death. How do you think this rates among the pivotal moments of English or British history? There's always been a sort of historical controversy whether you, know, you artificially you use 1485 as a dividing point between the medieval world and the early modern period. And obviously there's a lot of con continuity and historians have done an enormous amount of work to show that the medieval world you know, does continue. But still, in my mind, the Bosworth does represent you know, a, a key moment. It, it is undoubtedly one of the most important battles of, of English history. Um, it could have gone either way. You know, it's worth positing the thought of what England could have been like if Richard had won. You know, no reformation. Uh, we remain tied to the Catholic Church. Um, but I think in terms of the drama of the battle as well, it's, it's one of these battles that's not simply fought or won. It's, it's also a battle that is lost, and it's, it's lost not just because of what happens on the day, mm. but what's gone on months and years before. And it's, that, it's the culmination, which I've tried to get across in the book, that it, it's on an epic scale. Henry s comes from nowhere to slowly become the candidate, and then 
Bosworth is almost this relief point of this moment of release when actually not many noblemen turn up for the battle. So many have actually been killed and over the ensuing decades that it, it, it comes to a point where the bloodletting has to stop. Obviously, it doesn't. There's the Battle of Stoke yeah. later on, um, but it, the, the, the size of the defeat for Richard is you know, it's enormous for the Orchists and. Uh, Henry is consummate in his ability then to, to unite the two houses afterwards. Um, and so I think looking at it in, in, a, in a broader panorama of English history, you know, it does represent a, a significant moment from you know, the medieval chivalric world to a, a, a world of, of a probably more real politic. One recent development clearly about, about Bosworth has been dis- the discovery of Richard III's remains. And there's a debate going on at the moment about what, what should be done with them do you have a view about where Richard should be buried? Should he be in Leicester where he died or should he be in York where he kind of thrived? I was probably one of the few people who thought when the news came through in August last year that they may have discovered Richard's remains, I thought, oh no, <laughs> that is really the last thing I needed. i just finished the first draft of the book yeah. and I thought, right, I probably have to rewrite you know, the ending and see what's going to happen. And I ran up to Leicester to... Uh, and I joined the queues which stretched around the block. Mm. It was like I was queuing for some concert to see <laughs> some celebrity. And it just goes to show that, you know, history is still li- living history. But there will always be discoveries, remarkable discoveries to be made. We always knew he was under that car park, but just never thought there would yeah. be any chance of really effectively getting to the remains. Um, I think it's fascinating to look at actually the remains and the wounds to actually look at how... Richard died, and I've tried to do that in the book, tried to sort of recreate his final, his final death scene. But when it comes to the, uh, the uh, burial and where he should be, I mean, I'm also, um, for my sins, a, a member of parliament, and there's been several debates yeah. already, and I've taken <laughs> part in these debates and, uh, and called for a, a state funeral. I think I should probably call for a, a royal ceremonial funeral. Um, but uh, I do think that when it comes to the burial, which I think is next May 2014, we should celebrate um, his uh, his interment with appropriate ceremonial. Obviously, he was an anointed king. And whether it comes to the competing claims of Leicester and York, I I think the legal position is is clear that it should be should be Leicester. The issue with York is interesting because everyone said, "Oh, well, this is where Richard wanted to be buried. He chose this place." And not really. When you look at yeah. the evidence, he set up a chantry for a hundred priests to celebrate Mass for his soul at York. But he also set up chantries at Baynard's Castle in London and also in Middleham. So if you take that logic, you know, there's several places where Richard could have asked yeah. to be buried. His wife, Anne Neville, who died in March 1485, was buried in Westminster Abbey. Um, you know, Richard himself moved Henry VI to um, St. George's uh, Chapel in Windsor, where his, su- his um, brother, yeah. Edward IV, is buried. So th- there are lots of competing claims. I personally also feel that in terms of the money and investment that went into the dig, you know, what Leicester and the Richard III Society went out of their way, put their neck out to actually make that investment. And so, you know, I think that finders keepers, really. And I know this is probably quite a silly question, but if you'd, had you been around in 1485, which side would you have been on at Bosworth? Ooh, which side would I have been on? I think I might have been, to be honest, being a politician myself, <laughs> I, I, it's in, it's, 15th century, I do have a lot of sympathy with because, you know, you stick your neck out sometimes in politics and you're always then going to, as a result, be unpopular one side or the other. When you look at actually some of the, the, the people who made it through at the end, they didn't take part at all. Uh, there was a William Earl of Barclay, uh, famous character who, uh, he gave money to Henry and he gave men to Richard. But he said and he, he didn't turn up himself at all. He was covered. <laughs> so he, he, was, he was covered either way. And I think that's what happens with Thomas Stanley, is Thomas Stanley refuses to move, knowing sort of how dangerous it might be mm-hmm. if actually he makes that, that manoeuvre. William Stanley, on the other hand, hasn't got anything to lose, um, whereas um, Thomas Stanley does. So... I'd probably be somebody who would be maybe sitting on the, on, on, uh, out on the sidelines. Um... The, the Yorkists themselves, though, are a, are a remarkable dynasty when you, when you think about sort of how they managed to 
transform the medieval landscape in, in, in such a short period of time as well. I mean, Edward IV as well, the remarkable general who won, won all his yeah. battles, um, and remarkable discipline as well, as did Richard, had, you know, remarkable discipline. It's, um, unusual that he should have lost Bosworth when he'd been such a successful general at Tewkesbury and at Barnet. Um, you know, he was a, a br- brilliant military character. But, uh, I guess probably I'd, I, yeah, I might sit out. I, I got involved in this project, obviously, th- with the sort of Tudor mindset. But actually, as I went through, I realized that it just simply wasn't about the rise of the Tudors alone. It was also about the decline of the Yorkists. That was Chris Skidmore. Chris's book, Bosworth, The Birth of the Tudors, is out now, published by WNN. As I mentioned before, Chris has written an article on Bosworth and the rise of the Tudors for our June issue. Also in this month's magazine, we explore the secret life of Elizabeth I, revisit the conquest of Everest, consider the death of a suffragette martyr, and explore medieval monasteries. Our June issue is out now in all good news agents and, of course, digitally. And now we have a short advertisement break. Almost a hundred years ago, the fields of northern France and Flanders witnessed the tragedy that was the Great War. Today, many of us are planning journeys of remembrance or discovery to bring your visit to life. The Great War Remembered Project, funded by the European Union, has the perfect free app for you to download. Diaries 1418 tells the story of William Naylor, who discovers an old war diary in an attic. Delving into these yellowing pages, you will set off with him in his great-grandfather's footsteps to witness history and capture memories of the Great War. Download the free app, Diaries 1418, from the App Store or Google Play, and bring your Great War journey to life. From New York Times number one best-selling author Steve Berry comes The King's Deception, a white-knuckle ride conspiracy thriller full of deception and political intrigue, taking you back to the Tudor court where an extraordinary secret is waiting to be revealed. Dan Brown says, My kind of thriller. I love this guy, says Lee Child. From Middle Temple to Windsor Castle, Oxford to Hampton Court, follow former Justice Department agent Cotton Malone as he attempts to unravel the mystery before innocent lives are lost in 21st century Britain, including Malone's son. Read The King's Deception by Steve Berry. Out now. Before our next interview, I'd like to quickly mention that tickets are on sale for our History Weekend Festival. It's taking place in the historic Wiltshire town of Malmesbury from the 25th to the 27th of October and will include talks from some of Britain's leading historians, including Max Hastings, Michael Wood, Dan Snow, Susanna Lipscomb, Dominic Sandbrook and Kate Williams. For the full lineup and ticket information, visit historyweekend.com. The future of Europe and the role of its individual member states is a subject that is once again under the spotlight following the unrest caused by the global financial crisis. I spoke to Brendan Sims, the author of a new book on Europe, about the importance of international relations and what he thinks the future holds for the continent. So how do you go about writing a history with such a broad scope? Well, I think what you need is a, is a very clear theme that holds the whole project together. And once you've got that, and you've got, as it were, the essence of an idea in your mind, um, then I think the, the narrative and the analysis unfolds from that. But you have to have the starting point. Um, And so the starting point for this um, is obviously 1453 in terms of time. Um, Why that particular date? Well, it's it's a date which is significant for two reasons. Um, First of all, I mean, it's obviously an iconic date in European history with the fall of Constantinople. But I choose the date uh, in that respect because of its importance for the history of Central Europe and the fact that then... Uh, Germany, Central Europe, is in the firing line uh, of the Ottoman advance. And a major organizing principle for European and particularly for German and Central European history becomes for about 100 years the Ottoman threat. The other reason, and this is perhaps a little bit more counterintuitive, is that 1453 is technically regarded as the date at which the Hundred Years' War between England and France uh, came to an end. And it's, if, if you like, it's the greatest foreign policy catastrophe in English history ever, you know, the loss of the French Empire. And so it, it bookends very nicely 
uh, the story in two respects. First of all, um, having dealt with the English, the French are better able to turn their attention to the affairs of the Holy Roman Empire, to the affairs in Germany. So it, it, it impacts my story in that way. And secondly, um, after the fall of France, England is convulsed with, uh, if you like, a kind of a post-mortem on the reasons for the defeat. And so then it enables me to start another uh, line or another um, theme of the book, which is the way in which foreign policy debates drive the domestic politics of individual countries. Mm. That's something that really interested me about the book is that um, events that are apparently national events or internal events are actually shaped by external forces yeah. in a way that I didn't realise. Um, how much do you think the fate of individual European countries has been bound up in what's going on elsewhere? Well, I mean, the overarching uh, concept here is um, what is known as the primacy of foreign policy. Uh, which goes back to the 19th century, essentially to, to Leopold von Ranke, the, the great granddaddy, really, of empirical historians, although he didn't actually use the term. But the argument is that uh, what drives the domestic um, politics of a country is essentially its position within the world, and that uh, social uh, structure, um, economic system, and so on, um, is moulded by that, determination to maintain one's independence. Um, and I think, you, I mean, that's a theme which runs right the way through the book. It's an, it's an organizing principle. And I think it's, it, it is a, a, um, a, a tool which enables you to understand almost everything that happens in Europe um, over the past 500 years. It doesn't, doesn't obviously give the answer to, to, to every single question. And as I say in the book, there are times when the primacy of foreign policy doesn't apply, and it applies less as we reach you know, the present day of the last two decades or so after the end of the Cold War. But generally speaking, it, it explains a great deal. And in what ways uh, do you think that states exerted control over other states in Europe? Well, the, the most obvious uh, form of control is, of course, the hard military power, um, either explicit or more often than not implicit. Um, and then there's hard economic power, controls of currencies or of credits. Um, and then there's also, in the, but this is rather more weakly represented in the book, there's if, you know, what Joseph and I call soft power, which is the power to get people to want to be like you. Um, but that, I think, is also there, mm, okay. and particularly in the, the attraction uh, of the Western democratic model the traction of the European project, at least until relatively recently. Um, these are all forms of power, mm. of getting people to do things. Um, are there any particular examples of things that we might otherwise regard as national yes. events that you think actually are you know, kind of more complicated? Absolutely. Well, I, th I think to, to take some fairly um, salient instances, um, the, uh, the English Civil War begins effectively as a revolt by Parliament and by the Protestant public sphere against um, the foreign policy of James I and, and later, of course, of Charles. In other words, the, the perceived failure of the Stuart monarchy to defend the Protestant cause in Germany, which is regarded as the main bulwark of English security in the last resort, uh, because if Protestantism in Germany falls, then Protestantism in the Low Countries is in grave threat, and if Protestantism in the Low Country falls, then, of course, the Catholic enemy uh, will be in the channel ports and is able to, to threaten the south of England. Um, and it's, it's very clear that in the 1620s and even the early 1630s, uh, the, the, the failure to support um, Frederick of the Palatinate, the, the Winter King, uh, the Protestant interest in Germany, is the main bone of contention with the crown, to which then others are added. That's one example. An another one, should be a familiar example, would be the French Revolution, which again is driven very largely in its early stages by disenchantment of the public sphere with the Bourbon retreat in foreign policy in Europe, but in particular uh, the retreat in Central Europe and Eastern Europe, the failure to push Bourbon interests in Germany, the failure to support the Poles, uh, the beatings uh, dealt out to the Ottoman Empire, which was a French ally, uh, the intimidation of the Swedes, uh, and so on. So the, Fre the, the French Revolution, and in fact Ranke said this, uh, um, uh, more than 150 years ago, uh, the French Revolution can very much be seen also as a revolt against the foreign policy of the Ancien Regime.
That's brilliant. Thank you. I mean, you have mentioned there that a kind of major theme in this book is Germany's central role in all of this. How much is that down to its central position or its history or mm. kind of both of those factors? Well, it's, it, it's both of those factors and more. Um, it's, it's, it's obviously, uh, to a considerable extent, driven by location. Uh, Germany uh, is at the heart of Europe, geographically. And this has two consequences. First of all, that it is the area where the interests of most European powers, and indeed um, in the 20th century also of extra-European powers, intersect. Um, and, it's, and you see this in, for example, I mentioned the English preoccupation with uh, securing the Low Countries, um, an important part of which, or the central part of which, is securing the Holy Roman Empire. You see this in uh, the French um, concern to break open the Habsburg Ring of Encirclement around their country uh, through uh, penetrating the Holy Roman Empire. Um, you see this in uh, the Russian attempts to, to dominate the Holy Roman Empire and many other examples, including, of course, the Ottoman Turks, uh, for whom the, Otto, the, the Holy Roman Empire is, a, uh, is the, the main target, really, uh, in the 16th and 17th century, more important even than the Mediterranean. Um, and, of course, uh, it's also a, a vacuum which sucks in outside powers um, and a, an area through which you know, mar armies march to, 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 to fight each other, uh, el possibly elsewhere in some instances. Um, so all that's important. Germany is also important because of its huge population, the wealth and the skill of its inhabitants. And so what you see, and I, I describe this in, in great detail in the book, is a concern on the part of the protagonists to try and access those resources for their own purposes. Um, for example, by uh, taking over the title of Holy Roman Emperor, um, or um, at least to deny those resources to somebody else. So either, either way, Germany is central uh, to their preoccupations. Um, you see this particularly in the 18th century, where the uh, Habsburgs and the French and, and the British contest for dominance uh, in Germany, or at least to deny that dominance uh, to the other power. And then there's the ideological element as well. Um, Germany is the cockpit of the Reformation struggles. Uh, it is the cockpit of many of the great um, ideological divides of the 19th and 20th century, particularly in the 20th century. It's where the three utopias of Wilsonian democracy and Nazism, of course, and, and Soviet uh, communism, where they meet and, and they contest uh, throughout the, the mid-20th uh, uh, century. And there's also the question, finally, of uh, you know, the, um, le the legitimacy, in particular, I'm talking now about the early modern period, which is conferred on actors by having the imperial title, because the Holy Roman Emperor is technically the senior uh, monarch, potentate in Europe. He's the emperor, after all. Um, and uh, there is a certain sort of cultural, ideological cachet or legitimation that goes with that. And so it's no accident that many of the figures in the book, you know, Henry VIII um, of England, uh, Francis I of France, um, the man who later becomes Charles V, uh, they're all contestors, um, contestants for the position of Holy Roman Emperor. You mentioned in the book that um, whoever controls um, kind of Central Europe controls Europe and therefore controls the world. Um, do you think there are any other areas of Europe or of the world that come close to being so important in terms of that? No, I, do, I, I would struggle to identify an area that would have anything like the salience of Central Europe. And this, I mean, this is not simply my retrospective um, categorization or assessment. I mean, this actually, uh, you can, you know, maps onto the perceptions of protagonists at the time. I've mentioned some early modern examples, but you see this also in the thinking of U.S. strategists in the 20th century, where they talk about, uh, you know, sort of a heartland in uh, Europe, Central Europe. Uh, which they need to deny to the Soviet Union and to win over to their side. So you see this theme is sort of replicated over hundreds of years. And I, 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 I don't see any other area that, that comes near. Yeah, of course, there are, um, there are uh, uh, points or places in, in the world which um, are the subject of contention, you know, say Korea, for instance, the Cold War. But the argument I make in the book is that, in fact, what's been fought out in Korea isn't necessarily just a struggle in Asia, but it's actually 
a struggle for Central Europe. In other words, it's, it, it's drawing the line in Korea, but very much uh, with a view to making the point that Soviet um, aggression, as they see it, will be resisted in Germany, and, and to encourage the Germans, I mean, this is explicitly, the point is explicitly made, that they won't be left in the lurch um, if there's going to be an attack in Central Europe. You touched there on the state, the United States. Um, how do you think the U.S. has um, impacted on kind of relationships within Europe? Well, the United States, I mean, I think there are two stories here. One is the story of the U.S., uh, if you like, intellectual constitutional engagement with Germany. Um, that's the fact that uh, the model of the Holy Roman Empire is regarded by the American patriots when they come out of the War of Independence, and they're, they're in a rather difficult situation. They've got problems with their debts. They're surrounded by hostile powers. They've got internal divisions. And there's some doubt as to whether the, um, the 13 states, the ex-colonies, uh, will be able to survive as an independent state. And, but they've got a United States of America, but it's effectively a confederation. And they look at the old country, and they are... Uh, looking for inspiration as to how they should organize their polity. And what's very striking is that Germany is a negative example. They don't want to be like the Holy Roman Empire, which they regard as sclerotic, feeble parliament, emasculated emperor, um, you know, the subject of countless interventions by outside powers. Um, and they would rather build a sort of a mighty union on Anglo-Scottish lines. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, of course, is the strategic engagement of the United States with... Um, Europe and particularly with Germany um, and that strategic engagement um, with Europe is there from the very beginning of the Republic um, so there, I don't think there's ever any sort of time of innocence of isolation where the United States isn't interested in, in fact the early years are times when they're most profoundly concerned because that's the weakest and they fear as I said being, being swallowed up um, but what, what begins to develop on the, um, on the US side is, is the idea that what happens in Europe will have an impact on them, um, either in the form of the ambitions of the colonial powers, uh, France and Britain, who perhaps haven't given up their ambitions in North America, or um, the uh, presence of, of, of new other and rising powers on their borders. So and one thing I deal with in the book is um, the French intervention in Mexico as supported by, funnily enough, the Egyptian government in the um, 1860s. And um, then, of course, the, the, Ameri the, the German penetration, much magnified in the imagination of Latin America, particularly of Mexico, in the period leading up to the First World War. So that you have, by the time America, the United States, joins the First World War, um, a profound consciousness that what happens in Europe, and particularly in Germany, will have direct strategic implications for them at home. So the, the Atlantic shrinks, if you like. How far does this desire to... Um, be in control of an empire, um, influence leaders around Europe? I mean, are there any particular examples of figures who you think have been particularly influenced by this desire? To, to dominate Europe as a, as, well as a single imperial yes, force? Yes, Well, I think the, the three figures um, that spring to mind in the early modern period are Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, of course, ruled huge Habsburg conglomerates spanning, you know, Spain... Um, Austria, the Low Countries, parts of Eastern France, what is today Eastern France, North, Northern Italy, Naples, Sicily, um, and of course the overseas empire of the Spaniards. Um, and he was accused, to a certain extent justly, of aiming for what was called universal empire. Um, and the same was said of Louis XIV, um, and indeed his interest in, in Germany is driven also by that, that concern, uh, and Napoleon, clearly, who did in fact control more or less the whole of continental Europe, and particularly Germany, and toyed for some time with the idea of taking on the German imperial title, so you see this theme again. Um, and in the 20th century, uh, you know, uh, domination of Europe clearly was, was part of um, uh, Adolf Hitler's design. So, so these, these ambitions have been there, yes. So what lessons do you think exploring Europe's history can offer us about present-day Europe? I mean, I think one always has to be very careful with the lessons of history, um, because clearly um, we historians look at the past. We're not prophets. I think I would be a very bad prophet. Um, but now I'm going to disregard everything I've just said. Um, and I think that 
if there is a lesson for the, for the current issue, which is really the question of the future of the Eurozone and of the European project more generally, um, the, the two lessons I think that emerge out of my book are, um, on the one hand, uh, there is the German question. How does, how does Europe coexist with a strong or a weak Germany? Um, and one part of the historical answer to that uh, has been uh, the creation of the Holy Roman Empire, or at least the Holy Roman Empire as it developed, um, and which essentially was a structure for the diffusion of power, the containment of conflict, and in many respects, the uh, European Union of today is like the Holy Roman Empire. It, too, was designed uh, to a considerable extent to deal with the German question, to embed, as the phrase goes, it, one could use other words, but that's the one that uh, um, uh, is often favoured, uh, to embed Germany in these broader European structures. Um, there are two problems with that currently. First of all, that particular structure seems to be breaking up. Um, and secondly, that in, in a sense, as a result, um, many of the disadvantages of the Holy Roman Empire, its sclerotic nature, the slow decisions, its failure to project power outside, its failure to represent its interests on the, on the wider stage, many of those characteristics have been imported into the, the new Europe. So one lesson is that Europe should not be like the Holy Roman Empire. The second lesson is that there is also a solution this is a problem from history, but there's a solution from history. And that is what I try to argue from the book, is the superiority, uh, in historical terms, of the Anglo-American model of constitutional development. That the British in 1707, and the uh, union between Scotland and England, uh, which created this vibrant fiscal military state of a single debt, uh, for which the parliament, the political nation as representing parliament, is responsible, a single army, that kind of thing. And that particular model um, was taken up by the American colonists, who, as I said, had rejected, specifically in the Federalist Papers, and, and I, I cite some fairly choice examples of people like Alexander Hamilton beating up on the, the constitution of the Holy Roman Empire. That particular example was picked up uh, by the colonists, as I say, um, and produce the United States. Now, it seems to me, if you're asking me for a uh, prescription, um, or I will give you a prescription even unasked <laughs> for a record, <laughs> um, it seems that the only answer for the Eurozone is to create some such uh, uh, political union on Anglo-American lines. Um, so there's no need to reinvent the wheel, uh, create something uh, sui generis. I think the answer is there from history. How far do you think we can lay the causes of things like the global financial crisis on European issues and how much are they are kind of caused by forces outside of Europe? Mm. Well, I, I think that the global financial crisis as understood um, as, you know, the 2008 crash, Lehman and all the rest of it, that of course is a global crisis of, of capitalism and not specifically related uh, to Germany. Uh, the sovereign, Euro sovereign debt crisis, which is actually the crisis we're talking about at the moment, because in a sense, although things are not rosy, um, the United States and also I think Great Britain have mastered the crisis um, in, you know, to a considerable extent through the instruments open to them as fiscal states as they were constituted um, in earlier times. The problem uh, in Europe is, of course, it doesn't have quite those instruments um, and so it doesn't it really doesn't have that sort of legitimacy uh, through an elected government to, to get a grip on the crisis and the other uh, problem going back to the origins is that um, on the eurozone periphery uh, the reason one of the reasons for the crisis apart from the behavioral issue um, of, of risk taking um, and taking on, on credits that, that turned out to be un, unrepayable is that in order to embed Germany in this larger European whole, it was insisted, particularly by the French, that there be a common currency which would then, as, as it were, um, absorb and dilute the power of the great Deutschmark. Um, that in turn uh, led to the common currency, a central bank, and a single policy on interest rates and all the rest of it.
And the result was then, of course, to flood, um, as we all know, uh, the Eurozone periphery with a tsunami of, of, uh, of cheap credit, which produced the problem. So the irony um, is that uh, a lot of this is, is the result of an attempt to contain and embed Germany as much as anything else. So the result has been in the perception of some people and the increase of German power. What do you think the risks are if we don't successfully manage this? Do you think that Europe stands at risk of splitting up? Yes. I, I mean, I think if you look at these phenomena historically, um, policies rise and fall. We had for hundreds of years a Polish state. Between 1772 and 1795, that state disappeared for good reasons, not all of which were the fault of the Poles, but which had substantially also to do with the internal structure of the Polish state. The Holy Roman Empire, the organizing prince of the book, disappeared after, if you like, 1,000 years in 1806. So failure is possible. It's a constant. Um, there's nothing written in the stars to say that the European Union will exist forever or even for the next 10 years. Um, and the danger is that as you imply, the Eurozone um, sovereign debt crisis will split up the Union. And if, if that happens, then we will have the reconstitution of national currency, the return of the Deutsche Mark, and we will be in a totally different um, scenario in Europe, which might be a good thing or might be a bad thing. But I think if there is the option of a Eurozone political union, then that is vastly preferable uh, to both what we have now and the return to the national states. Return to the national states, from my point of view, would only make sense if we then had in Europe a series of viable national actors who could cooperate to do the things that Europe needs to do on the world scene. Mm. Unfortunately, because of Germany's history, because of its political structure and its whole political culture, they're actually uniquely unsuited to step up uh, to step up to the plate in, in that regard. And they would find it easier to do so as part of a single European state than as their own national state. That was Brendan Sims discussing the past and future of Europe. Brendan is the author of Europe, The Struggle for Supremacy, which is published by Alan Lane. And that's almost all for this week. Do get in touch with your views on podcast at historyextra.com and we'll do our best to read out some of your messages in future episodes. We're also, of course, on Twitter at History Extra and on Facebook.com slash History Extra. Next time, we'll be featuring Anna Whitelock discussing Elizabeth I, recorded at BBC History Magazine's recent Tudor's Day. Do join us for that. The History Extra podcast was recorded in Bristol and produced by Jack Fletcher. <laughs>